to go live right now. Okay. Welcome to the After Hours Program. And good evening, everybody, and welcome to a very special edition of After Hours AM. We are actually talking serial killers tonight, and it's it's a subject matter I didn't know a ton about. I don't know a lot about it either. Until I kind of jumped into Harold's work here. Harold Schneck, Schneck, can you please pronounce your last name for me? I do not want to massacre your last name. <laughs> it's, I uh, appreciate that. It's Schechter. Schechter. There it is. That's what I thought it was, but I thought, in the back of my head, you know what? I hate it when my last name's slaughtered, so I figure I thought <laughs> you do it. Is a professor of American literature and culture at Queens College, the University of New York. Boy, he, he has uh, written about them all. You know, he's done a lot of nonfiction work. He's done a lot of, fic- you know, real hardcore serial killer stuff. You did, You wrote Fatal, the book's Fatal. Friend Depraved, mm-hmm. Deranged, Depraved. Yep. Those are yep. really, really good books. And that's all nonfiction. Oh, thank you. And then you also, your fiction work is The Telltale Corpse, The Humbug, mm-hmm. Wow, Nevermore, The Mask of Red Death. Those and the, those are Edgar Allan Poe stuff. And I got to say, when I looked at that as well, you are a very, very talented writer, my friend. Yeah, well, thank you. Appreciate that very much. Not a problem. You you deserve every accolade you have. And uh, well, thank you. you know, Harold, we're gonna hit the ground running. I'm gonna ask you what kind of got you mixed up in this world of serial killers. Um, well, you know, I mean, I'm a baby boomer, so uh, I grew up at a time when you know the TV and movies were just full of all this uh, horror stuff. You know, I mean, I spent my childhood watching all these Friday night, uh, fright night shows, and so on and read all these horror comics. So, you know, I've always been real interested in horror and monsters and, you know, why people are interested in hearing about horror and monsters. Um, and then uh, at a certain point, uh, I discovered, this is uh, about in my 30s, I guess, you know, I was right, mm-hmm. had become a writer by then, and uh, I had discovered that uh, Psycho and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which are, Two of my favorite horror movies, movies were both based on um, an actual killer, uh, Ed Dean mm-hmm. of Wisconsin, and uh, that was very fascinating to me. It's also, uh, as it turns out, Thomas Harris uh, based his character um, Buffalo Bill in The Silence of the Lambs partly on Ed Dean. So, I mean, here were the, from my point of view, three scariest movies of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, that had all been based on an actual criminal. And I started to look into that case, and that became the subject of my first serial killer book, Deviant. 
mm-hmm. and after that, um, you know, that just seemed to be a, a subject that fascinated me and that I, I seemed, for better or worse, <laughs> to have <laughs> some kind of gift for writing about. So, um, yeah, that became the basis of my uh, really uh, career as a serial killer writer. You know, the Ed Gein one is close to where we're in northern Minnesota by the Wisconsin uh-huh. border here. And yeah. so he is well known up here, the Ed Gein story. Uh, you know, a lot of people even to this day up here, they, they don't really talk about it a lot. But when they do talk uh-huh. about it, it's almost yeah. out of fear. Well, you know, he was, uh, you know, kind of a, it sounds strange to say it. I mean, you know, he's turned out to be sort of an important cultural figure in, uh, well, late 20th century uh, and early 21st century American American culture. You know, many people regard the Dean case as the beginning of uh, modern American horror. Um, partly because, he, well, largely because he uh, directly inspired Psycho. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Psycho was the beginning of this whole kind of slasher movie trend, you know, that we still, you know, still dominates a lot of uh, horror movies and stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a you know, there, there are, uh, of all the horrible crimes that unfortunately happen um, almost on a daily basis, there are only a handful mm-hmm. that kind of become these, you have to say, almost mythic kind of crimes, you yeah. know, like Lizzie Borden uh, or the Leopold and Loeb case in the 1920s or the Charles Manson case in the 1960s. And, you know, Ed Gein is one of those kind of mythic American crimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and a lot of people, um, when I did mention it, that aren't from here, asked me, well, mm-hmm. who's this Ed Gein character? And I yeah. figure I'd wait to tell that until I had someone as knowledgeable as you are to kind of give them the the quick rundown mm-hmm. uh, of what he was all about. Well, you know, Dean was a uh, a, 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 a farmer in Wisconsin, uh, lived in a small town called Plainfield, uh, in uh, sort of uh, ninety miles northwest of Madison, Wisconsin. Um, very kind of at that time hard scrabble area of the country. Uh, one journalist at the time called that area the Great Dead Heart of Wisconsin. Anyway, Dean <coughs> lived with his family in this remote farmhouse uh, outside of this very small town. Mm-hmm. And uh, he uh, had a brother named Henry, uh, mother, father. The father apparently was uh, kind of an abusive alcoholic type who died when uh, the boys were relatively young, leaving them to live with this very religiously fanatical mother um, who raised them to believe that women uh, were evil and uh, sex was evil. And uh, Ed, in particular, was this sort of extreme mama's boy who was completely under the thumb of this domineering mother. Uh, His brother, Henry, died under very mysterious circumstances, and uh, given what later emerged about Ed, some people feel that Ed might have actually murdered his own brother, partly because the brother started to become very, very critical of the mother, and also possibly because Ed just wanted the mother to himself. In any case, Ed was left living alone in this ramshackle, isolated farmhouse with this uh, crazy mother. And uh, eventually she died of uh, a stroke, and he was left living all by himself in this very, very creepy, dilapidated farmhouse outside of town. And people, the people in Plainfield just sort of regarded him as the uh, village weirdo, you know? Uh, he, was, he was actually not a stupid man, but, but he did have a sort of simple-minded kind of way about him. Uh, anyways, it turned out he was uh, so obsessed with his mother that after her death, he tried to dig up her body um, and bring it home with him, which he was unable to do because that area of Wisconsin uh, has very sandy soil and a lot of 
graves are lined with concrete vaults, and turns out his sure. mother was buried in one of those, so he couldn't get to his mother. But for a, a twelve, <laughs> for a twelve-year period, beginning in 1945, after her death, uh, Ed would very carefully read the newspapers, and and whenever some local woman, middle-aged or elderly woman. Uh, who vaguely resembled his mother, whenever one of them would die, he would drive out in his pickup truck to the cemetery at night and dig up her body and bring it back to his farmhouse and uh, dissect the body. Oh. And he would, yeah. And he was, uh, you know, people think of Ed Gein as a, as a serial killer, and, and he did end up killing a few women, but he was most, mostly a necrophile. He was mm-hmm. preying on the dead. Uh, he would dig up these uh, women's corpses, bring them back to his farmhouse, dissect their bodies, and make different kinds of uh, artifacts out of their body parts. Uh, he would make uh, uh, he upholster his chairs with their skin, oh, and uh, yeah, he would make uh, belts out of their body parts and uh, the shade poles out of their lips. But he also would skin their faces and uh, tan them and stuff them and hang them up in his bedroom as kind of uh, hunting trophies almost. Um, oh my and he also, he, he flayed the uh, uh, upper torso and the lower torso of some corpses and he made them into a skin suit and he would dress himself up in the skins of these women and pretend he was his own mother. Mm. That that would be and, where the Norman Bates probably were, took off from that story to be used. Well, the Hollywood. Norman Bates thing, and also the uh, you know the Buffalo Bill. That's where Thomas Harris got the Buffalo Bill idea, as you I'm sure remember in Sons of Lambs. Mm-hmm. You know, Buffalo Bill is a serial killer who is making a skin suit out of the out of the uh, a skin of uh, his female victims. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, anyway, this went on for about twelve years. And finally, uh, Ed um, murdered, he, uh, I guess he ran out of uh, suitable corpses in the local cemetery, so he murdered a, a woman. He murdered a woman named Bernice Warden, who was a 60-something-year-old grandmother who uh, ran the local hardware store. Uh, he murdered her one day. He murdered her on the first day of deer hunting season in 1957 when he knew all the men would be out of town in the woods. And he brought her corpse back to his uh, to his farmhouse and strung her up in his summer kitchen and dressed the body out as a deer. Uh, he headed her, gutted her. Anyway, uh, when her son came back and, and discovered she was missing and saw these blood stains on the floor of the hardware store, Dean had come in and shot her in the head. Uh, they kind of a suspicion immediately fell on Dean because he had been kind of hanging around the store and bothering the grandmother mm-hmm. and um, with, or uh, Frank's mother. And uh, the police immediately went out to Dean's place and, and found this body hanging up there. And then they broke into his house and you know, they discovered this house of horror full of all these body part relics and artifacts. Oh. And uh, anyway, that and it was a huge case. I mean. Life magazine, which, of course, at that time, basically every household in America got, uh, had it as its lead story in uh, December 1957. And Time magazine covered it, and Newsweek covered it. It was just a huge story at the time. And um, uh, Robert Block, who is a horror writer living in Wisconsin, then based his novel Psycho on it. So, okay. anyway, that's the basically the game story in a nutshell. Now, what makes a serial killer? A serial killer? Yeah. What 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 makes well, it? Is it like people, a body count, count they, you have to achieve, or, or what's... I'll let you answer that. Well, there's a big distinction between serial murder and mass murder. Serial murder, the, you know, the term serial killer is very, very recent. In my own researches, I discovered that it wasn't used uh, in the newspapers until the 1980s. Uh, the first time it actually appeared in print uh, was in 1982 or so uh, in a discussion 
uh, of the Atlanta serial murders, the child murders down in Atlanta. Sure. But, but the crime itself has always existed. And basically what is meant by serial murder is what used to be called lust murder. Um, it's a, it's, it's really a, a crime of extreme sexual sadism where you have these killers. I'm talking about people like Ted Bundy and John Wayne Gacy and Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, the uh, kind of classic serial killers of the 70s and 80s um, that we associate with the term. You know, these people are extreme sexual sadists mm -hmm. who derive very, very sick pleasure from stalking and capturing and really and torturing their victims, which provides them, again, with a very depraved kind of sexual pleasure. So what serial killing basically is, is it's a series of murders um, that are committed by a person uh, with some kind of uh, what the FBI calls a cooling off period between them. In other words, uh, they'll commit a murder, one of these horrendous murders, which they'll take a victim and again subject them to all kinds of torture and stuff from which they derive this sexual pleasure. And then a certain amount of time will go by uh, before their next murder, and they'll continue to do this, gotcha. um, you know, over and over again. I mean, you know, uh, it, it's hard to put a numerical number on serial killer, you know, two, three, four, whatever. But the main thing is that, you know, serial murder roughly follows the pattern of normal male sexual behavior mm -hmm. in the sense that, you know, this person will fantasize about this act and build up this overwhelming desire for it, you know, and go out and seek a victim and then perform the act. And, and you know, as, as sick as it is, uh, the, 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 the torture and the killing will usually culminate in a sexual climax for this person. And then, you know, certain, and then they'll, they'll, they'll be satisfied for a while. And then that need will build up again and they'll go out and seek another victim and so on and so forth. No. And they'll keep doing it for as long as they can get away with it because, you know, it provides them with this pleasure. They don't want to be caught. They want to keep on doing it. So it's a bit and, of a myth uh, that they say that I've read a couple different places that serial killers secretly want to get caught. Well, you know, that's generally not true. You know, most serial killers do not want to get caught. Um, you know, uh, it, it is the case, you know, it ha seems to be the case. There have been some serial killers, I think, who do feel at some point that they are in the grip of some horrible compulsion that they would like to free themselves from. I mean, there's a very famous case, for example, um, back in the 40s, there was a young man named William Hirons who was known as the Lipstick Killer. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, he famously, uh, in one of the crime scenes, he's known as the Lipstick Killer because in one of the crime scenes he wrote on a mirror uh, in the apartment of the woman he had just killed. He wrote, uh, stop me before I kill again. Uh, but that's really pretty unusual. You know, most serial killers, if you look at, again, John Wayne Gacy or Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahmer or the BTK killer, you know, or, or a lot of these guys. I mean, I, I live on Long Island in New York. They've there's a serial killer uh, known as the Gilgo Beach Killer. They, they found a bunch of uh, young women prostitutes uh, whose bodies were dumped on a beach here. You know, nobody knows who he is. I mean, you know, most serial killers do not want to get caught. And they don't want to get caught because they enjoy what they're doing and want to keep doing it for as long as possible. Right. Exactly. Is that why there's so many more men serial killers versus women serial killers? Well, that's an interesting question. You know, there actually are quite a few women serial killers. It's just that um, female serial killers tend to commit their crimes in a different way than men do. Um, most female serial killers have been poisoners, um, but there actually have been quite a few female serial killers. Uh, uh, that is, you know, women who, uh, again, enjoy killing a series of people um, and torturing them, really, uh, with poison. Mm -hmm. 
over the course of years. I mean, you know, when you think of, uh, again, Bundy, Gacy, etc., that, that's that's just a very male form of serial murder. Yeah. Um, you know, like Jack the Ripper, for example. I mean, Jack the Ripper is the modern prototype of a serial killer. Uh, but, but again, that's, that's just the male form of serial murder. There's a female form of serial murder, and the female form of serial murder tends to take, uh, again, the form of poisoning somebody. Mm-hmm. And, but what, what people don't often realize about that is that, po- you know, dying, you know, by, by slow poisoning is often more horrific than, let's say, you know, some of these female poisoners are worse than Jack the Ripper. Well, well yeah, you know, I would imagine. Time. Yeah, because um, I was reading in uh, some of your writings about, about this particular nurse that would kill her yeah. her patients. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Angel, um, yeah. J- Jane Toppin. I mean, she was the one that got me interested in, in the whole phenomenon of female serial murder. Mm-hmm. You know, she was a private nurse, and she she ended up uh, confessing to over thirty one murders. She was she's actually considered the most prolific American serial killer before John Wayne Gacy. Wow. And uh, you know, sometimes people think of these uh, female poisoners as this kind of quaint Victorian, you know, arsenic and old lace, you know, sort of thing. But you know, Jane Toppin would uh, again. She was a nurse, so she knew how these how these poisons work. Yeah, she would, uh, you know, she would uh, slowly poison her victims and you know bring them close to death and then pull back and let them revive a little and then poison them again and and you know you know Jack the Ripper would basically slit the throat of his victims. They died very very quickly. Mm-hmm. You know all the horrible things he did to them was after they were dead already, but. Somebody like Jane Toppin was subjecting her victims to days and sometimes oh. weeks, you know, of slow gosh. torture. And then when they were, and then finally when she was ready to allow them to die, she would give a, a, a lethal dose of poison to them and crawl into bed with them and embrace them while oh. they were dying so she could feel their death throes. And she would, uh, you know, she would have a sexual climax at that time. So she was, uh, you know, she was, again, a, 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 what used to be called a lust murderer. Yeah. Wow. Um, which is what we now, well, what came to be called serial killers. So. It's unreal. A serial killers, or, you know, the term serial killers, like you said, is fairly new. But these individuals have been around a very long time. Well, I mean, I think they've always been around. Um, you oh, know, I yeah. think that it's just, uh, you know, one, you know, some small, thankfully, percentage of human beings. And again, it's sometimes people, you know, think it's just an American phenomenon, but it's a worldwide phenomenon. It's an age-old phenomenon. You know, years ago, I read a really fascinating book um, by a couple of Harvard um, anthropologists, a book called Demonic Males, and it's about the origins of male violence. You know, it looks at chimpanzee behavior, and and what these people discovered studying chimpanzees is that, you know, they're incredibly violent creatures, Mm -hmm. and uh, they routinely commit acts uh, that are very, very similar to the kinds of things that, you know, serial killers commit. Um, just kind of gratuitously cruel forms of torture and cannibalism and all kinds of stuff. And, uh, you know, if, if one is a believer in human evolution, <laughs> which I am, mm-hmm. you know, we're very closely related to chimpanzees. So some of this um, is just human nature. Yeah. It's human nature. It's just, you know, unfortunately, you know, we're a very, very violent species. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, if you look at the... Well, you know, again, the archaeologists have found very clear evidence, you know, that uh, back in our caveman era, you know, human beings routinely committed cannibalism, you know, Mm -hmm. and so on. So, you know, I just think human beings are violent. Well, it's one of the reasons we've, it's one of the reasons I'm talking to you now is that, you know, 
we are interested in hearing about this stuff. So. Oh, exactly. You know, the guy actually, the one that scared me the most, I guess, in some ways, if that's, they all scary, but Ted Bundy. I watched some yeah. of his video. He was so intelligent. Yeah. And he was just so cold. I mean, when you look at uh, Charles Manson, you see crazy. Yeah. Okay. When you watch Ted Bundy, even in the courtroom, he was cool, calm, and collected mm-hmm. all the way through. Yeah. And he has well, you know, well, Manson, you know, Manson was not a stupid person. But when you, the point about Bundy, I mean, this is one of the things that makes serial killers so terrifying, is that um, they appear to be so normal. You know, there's a, a famous book about psychopaths called The Mask of Sanity. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the things that, one of the things that I've discovered a lot of people are not totally aware of is the difference between a psych, a psychopath and a psychotic. Uh, you know, people tend to use those words interchangeably, but they, yes. they mean very different things. You know, psychotic is a, a person with a, well, a schizophrenic. I mean, somebody who's, who's, whose personality is really kind of shattered mm-hmm. and uh, who hears voices and has hallucinations. Ed Gein actually was probably psychotic. You know, he was having all kinds of hallucinations and hearing voices. And, you know, there are some serial killers who do. They, you know, hear voices telling them to murder people and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, but most serial killers are what's called psychopaths. And psychopaths are very rational people, uh, often with uh, an above-average intelligence, you know, who are able to seem very, very normal and very, very ordinary. To kind of fit but in. Who, yeah, with the rest you know, of us. You know, I'm sorry? Kind of fit in with the masses. Yeah, you totally. Know, wolf and, and, uh, and, yeah. But, but they lack, you know, they lack a conscience. They lack any capacity for human empathy. And, uh, you know, they see other human beings as just objects to be manipulated and exploited for their own pleasure. And, uh, you know, Bundy is a classic example of that. Mm-hmm. You know, they're very, you know, they're, they're, they're terrifying because, you know, they're rational people who use their rationality, you know, to commit these horrendously evil acts. Did that make them feel good? That's well, it makes it feel good, uh, but it also makes it very, very difficult for ordinary, well, it makes it, you know, it makes their victim, it makes people very vulnerable to them, you know, because they just seem so normal. And, and, and psychopaths also tend to be very, very manipulative. They tend to be con artists. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's very, very easy to fall into these traps, they say. Well, that's well, how they get their prey, so well, sure. to speak. Exactly. You exactly. know, it's, it's like a... Um, the predators. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. They're, they're predators, but they don't seem like predators. No. You know, they're predators who just seem as, you know, not only normal, but they often you know, can seem very, very, very charming. Likeable individuals. I mean, you know, yeah. uh, from yeah. outside. Well, yeah, because yeah. they have to lure their victims in. Mm-hmm. Very true. Exactly. You know, yeah. they don't have a web like a spider does, so they have to rely on their charm. Well, exactly. Right. And yeah. That is so scary. I mean, you know, when you watch movies about ghosts and goblins and this and that, that, that does not scare me half as much uh-huh. as serial killers do. Well... Well, I think that's partly because ghosts and goblins don't actually exist, but serial killers do. (laughs) They're right around the corner. You don't know. I mean, they could be anywhere. I read an article recently when I was getting ready for the show that they're anywhere from like 250 serial killers out there at any time. Well, I mean, that seems like a very high estimate. I mean, the estimates uh, that I've always heard are are, are lower than that. And, you know, you know, it is important to realize that most serial killers around, um, you know, tend to prey on what they call victims of opportunity. I mean, for example, you know, the one that has been at large here on Long Island, and I know a few years ago there there's one in Atlantic City. I mean, in, the majority of these kinds of criminals tend to prey on, you know, people like prostitutes and so on. You know, in general, the average middle-class American person um, is unlikely to run into a serial killer. Now, why do you um, think that is? 
Why do you think that is? Why do you think? Well, that again, I, I think that you know it's it's a sex crime, and uh, you know they they tend to they tend to target um, victims. Yeah, again, you know, prostitutes or what are called victims of opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they they just if you want to torture and murder, if you're a male heterosexual serial killer. And there are there are gay serial killers also, but if you're a male, you know, sexual serial killer, you know. Well, I, I think there are two reasons. First of all, again, it's easy to pick up a prostitute and lure her to some place, uh, you know, a motel room or whatever, where you can commit this act. Yeah. But there is another element as well, which is that a lot of these male heterosexual serial killers are full of a kind of actual loathing for women. You know, they often tend to see, tend to see you know, women as these loathsome, disgusting creatures, mm -hmm. and prostitutes kind of embody that for them. You know, there's a whole kind of serial killer that used to be called in the old days Harlot Killers. Again, Jack the Ripper is kind of a prototype for them, sure. um, but there have been many uh, male serial killers like that. You know, that they, they see prostitutes as kind of embodying the most loathsome aspect of womanhood. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of vengeance they're taking on these people. So. Wow. Okay. You know, I am up against the break here, so we got to go ahead and get out of here. But when we come back, we're going to talk more about serial killers. This is a fascinating subject. I, I'm, I'm really, really liking this. We'll be right back in about five minutes, folks. Enjoy the music. once wrote that the questioning mind needs to be instilled with both skepticism and wonder for the universe is a pretty big place filled with undelved mysteries sciences and life that we've barely begun to comprehend every month intrepid magazine brings you both the wondrous and the skeptical intrepid magazine focuses on science metaphysics ufos politics conspiracies and unexplained phenomenon all offered up by intrepid's cadre of writers and contributors comprised of a host of seasoned authors, pundits, and recognized names in their fields. The universe is indeed a big place, and where other magazines leave off, Intrepid Mag is just beginning. Subscribe to Intrepid Magazine today at www.intrepidmag.com. That's www.intrepidmag.com. It's your ideas, work, and creativity that make it your yard. At Ace, we're here to help with hoses and sprinklers to nurture growth, gardening tools for the shape of good things to come, even the right fertilizer and bug killers to make the grass a little greener. You'll find it all now at Ace, your place, with everything you need for your yard, plus helpful advice, almost like we're right there. Ace, the helpful place. 
The adventure of a lifetime awaits you in faraway Egypt. The Exodus Reality Adventure, February 12th to 26th of 2014. Join archaeologist Dr. John Ward and historian Scotty Roberts, co-authors of The Exodus Reality, as they retrace their expedition searching for the historical Moses and the Great Exodus. There are 10 seats available. For details, go to exodusreality.com. The land of the pharaohs beckons. Will you answer the call to adventure? This week, it's Classics Week. week starting monday right here on dub theater this is eric altman director of the pennsylvania bigfoot society and host of beyond the edge radio and you're listening to after hours a.m and welcome back to after hours radio before we left we're going to talk about all things serial killers we're going to continue to do that because i have a ton of questions more popping in my head as we talk i got a question for you harold has anybody ever just shown up to the police station and said hey i'm a serial killer take me in uh not to my knowledge no (laughs) no (laughs) you know i mean again you know serial killers um for the most part uh you know, derive their deepest pleasure, even, you have to say, kind of ecstasy almost, you know, from committing these kinds of crimes. So, um, again, you know, there there is the case, even, even William Hirons, who I mentioned, the famous mm-hmm. lipstick killer, you know, who wrote on the mirror of one of his crime scenes, please stop me before I kill again, did everything he could not to get arrested. So, uh, to my knowledge, there has never been a serial killer, you know, who has voluntarily turned himself in. Okay. I, I, I recently watched the movie again, seven, and uh-huh. that's a great movie of Brad Pitt in it. And I, I recommend yeah. it to anyone that hasn't yeah. seen it. Morgan Freeman. Yeah. It seems though, after I did a lot of research for the show and I've seen, watched the movie, that movie is so far from reality of how it kind of works. Mm-hmm. It's not even funny. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, generally speaking, you know, these Hollywood depictions of serial killers, well, you know, as you'd expect, I mean, they're very, very exaggerated. Same thing is true with Hannibal Lecter. I mean, there haven't really been these genius-level serial killers, you know, and something like, you know, there is something uh, called this, serial killers often have what criminologists call a signature, you know, which is some um, little kind of... A little calling card saying, yep, it was me. Yeah, kind of, kind of calling card. You know, the Boston Strangle, for example, would sometimes leave uh, the whatever he used to kill his victims tied in a little bow and so on. You know, but the whole notion that a serial killer would arrange his victims in this elaborate kind of tableau, uh, you know, to you know, to represent one of the seven deadly sins, mm. you know, it's just a, a total kind of Hollywood fantasy. Yeah, I, you know, the notion that you have a serial killer like uh, Hannibal Lecter who translates Dante, you know, and is an incredible gourmet 
you know, cook and so on and so forth. Again, it's it's kind of a Hollywood fantasy. Yeah, I, I would imagine that there those if they are out there, extremely far and few between. Uh, you know, because they're probably too preoccupied with their next high as a, a as a serial killer. You know. Well, again, you know, most serial killers are, you know, they're 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 very very ordinary, you know, people. Mm-hmm. Um, in a way, you know, the only thing that, you know, Ed Gein's a good example. I mean, Ed Gein was, you know, uh, he wasn't mentally challenged in a way. I mean, you know, he had a relatively normal IQ, yeah. um, but he was no genius. And, you know, he was a, pretty much a total non-entity, except for the crime kind of crimes he committed. You know, the only thing that really distinguishes some of these people is that they are capable, you know, of getting away for an extended period of time, you know, with these horrible murders. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly, like the cooling off period we talked about. Yeah, exactly. Well, and again, and again that cooling off period, you know, is kind of, uh, it's, a, it's, it's basically analogous This is to... You know, in terms of a normal person in get, having sex, you know, after that sexual need is met, you know, there's a certain period where that need subsides. Exactly. Uh, and, and then again, it builds up and builds up and builds up, and, and then the serial killer needs to find another victim, and then, again, the need subsides for a while, and, and so on, which is why serial murder... You know, it's that the pattern of serial murder is similar to that of normal sexuality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, now I watch a lot of Criminal Minds. Uh huh. Now, do you guys profile the serial killers similar to Criminal Minds the way they do? Uh, you know, again, the, the profiling thing is very, very controversial. For the most part, you know, I think that the way profiling is portrayed in movies on TV, again, it's, it's, it's very, very, very exaggerated. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like the way, you know, Sherlock Holmes will be able to solve a crime, you know, by this almost superhuman kind of thing. You know, I have a friend who's a medical examiner, for example, and he calls the show uh, CSI, you know, he refers to it as crime scene science fiction. You know, <laughs> you know in, in reality, uh, profilers have not, for the most part, you know, criminal profiling hasn't proven to be that that effective, you know, in mm-hmm. tracking down serial killers. You know, I think they could make certain sorts of generalizations about the serial murder, but the notion that they can identify so precisely who the exactly. killer is. They say, oh, clues. this guy's 5'10", 110 pounds, he's a white yeah. male, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, how do you get that from yeah. him strangling this woman? <laughs> well, again, you know, it's like with, you know, because it's like, you know, with the original Sherlock Holmes stories, you know. You know, Sherlock Holmes will look at, uh, you know, somebody will have dropped a wrist, uh, uh, you know, pocket watch, mm-hmm. and Sherlock Holmes will look at it under his magnifying glass. You know, again, be able to say, you know, well, you know, he'll, he'll say, you know, the person who owned this pocket watch was six feet tall and weighed 240 pounds. And, and then, you know, he'll explain it in a way that sounds very, very logical, um, but that in real life is completely impossible. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, you know, these are, you know, there's a huge, huge difference between these movies and TV shows and in reality. So, you know, it's again like CSI. You know, CSI, there'll be some security tape they'll get, and they'll be able to do a close-up, you know, and look in somebody's eyeball in the security tape and see the reflection of the mirror, and, yeah. you know, the uh, curvature. You know, that's just, uh, you know, it just doesn't happen. Unrealistic. So. And there's been okay. serial killers to be known to rent cars and travel to different states to commit their crime and then go back mm-hmm. to where they live, and no yeah. one's ever the wiser. Well, I mean, there are different kinds of serial killers. I mean, you know, there are nomadic serial killers who do travel to different, you know, places to commit their crimes. And then there are other serial killers who are kind of homebodies who bring their victims back to their own like, little lairs. Like Jeff you know, Dahmer. Like, uh, 
you know, uh, John Wayne Gacy, for example, you know, he would uh, pick up his victims and bring them back to his suburban house and commit all his crimes there. Uh, but then you have the other kind of serial killer who just travels around the country and uh, will commit a crime in one place and then leave town very quickly and, and so on. And, of course, those people are often much harder to track down. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, how, how did uh, Gacy get caught, wasn't it? How, and I heard a story saying he got caught because his house smelled. Is there any truth to that? I don't think that was the case with Gacy. That has been true of other serial killers. You know, I think that finally there were people with Gacy, you know, somebody, uh, uh, well, his last victim, um, I can't remember if it was a parent or a friend, I think it was a parent, but somebody knew that this uh, teenage boy had had this uh, appointment to go see Gacy, supposedly, you know, was for a job interview, and, uh, you know, then of course it disappeared. So uh, some suspicion fell on Gacy. And, of course, Gacy had had some previous arrest record, and uh, that's that's what finally did Gacy in. Gotcha. Okay, so it was not the stinky basement like the rumor No, says. I don't know, okay. because I think Gacy was, uh, you know, living in a, a remote enough place that nobody detected the smell. I mean, there have been serial killers, um, you know, who have been found because neighbors have suddenly complained, you know, of some horrible odor and so on. But. Sure. And th- and then, of course, we have, I promise to mention this for the folks here in the Midwest, Mr. Jeff Dahmer. Yeah, that's, Jeff Dahmer. That's well, in... Yeah, Dahmer was interesting. I mean, Dahmer was one of the very, very few serial killers I know who actually did seem to feel uh, after he was caught you know, a certain kind of uh, remorse for his crimes. Uh, that's pretty unusual with serial killers. You know, John Wayne Gacy is much more typical. Gacy went to his death denying he'd ever done anything wrong. Um, most serial killers are completely incapable of feeling sorry for the crimes they've committed. Um, but Dahmer did seem to feel that. Do you, do you think ahead. that was an act? I don't think so. I think it was genuine, and, and I think it's one of the reasons that he, you know, when he was put into prison, uh, he insisted on being um, put into the general prison population, and I, and I think part of that was he, he knew that he was he was going to be killed and uh, kind of wanted to die, so I think it was probably genuine on his part. Hmm. Not that that, I mean, that's not to, you know, in any way, you know, forgive him or anything yeah. like that, but... But um, just sort of an interesting thing with Dahmer that, uh, you know, I think, you know, he, he 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 felt himself to be a kind of monster, which most uh, serial killers don't. He had a moment of kind of self-realization. Yeah. You, yeah. you know, that I'm this and I'm, yeah. you know, sorry yeah. for what I've done and I want to make amends to some extent. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think that, again, I, I think... I'm not even sure I put it that I'm sorry for what I've done. I think it's like I'm sorry for, you know, who what I am. You know, almost. Yeah. You know, he, or, he or just, sorry I got caught. Could yeah. be. But, well, I just think he he knew he was a monster. Yeah. Um. And uh, and and uh, and wanted to end it all. So. So, yeah. Harold, have you ever sat eye to eye with? I mean, have you ever interviewed any of these serial killers for yourself, eye to eye, like sat across the table from? Yeah. I have not, actually. I've avoided that. There have been a couple of cases where um, uh, serial killers who uh, have been caught and are in prison, you know, have uh, uh, made efforts uh, through intermediaries to contact me and, you know, wanted me to write their, wanted me to write their books. And, oh. You know, I've, I've made that, uh, I've made it a point to avoid that. Um, I don't blame you. Yeah, I don't no. blame me either. Uh, you, you know, yeah. I wouldn't want to do it either. I would never want to interview a serial killer uh, on air or or any other time, quite honestly. And the, and the BTK killer, that's <laughs> another story that he seems so normal. In fact, he was a he he was a um, a canine or he was an animal enforcement officer in his community. Yeah. Uh, really? Yeah. Well, then that, you know that's very typical of these people. Let me just say also that. You know, what, what I'm interested in as a writer are historical cases, um, and and I'm also interested in, again, why out of all the 
horrific crimes that are mm-hmm. committed, again, sadly, almost on a daily basis. Um, again, not on the level of serial murder, but, but you, you know, a, a couple of years ago, uh, just as a kind of exercise, I would every day look through the newspapers and, and tear out, you know, s- mm-hmm. some horrible crime. And again, it was like every day there was some horrible crime that was committed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, 99.9% of those, again, you might read it in the morning paper and then forget about. Sure. Um, but every now and then, you know, a certain crime will happen, a certain criminal will appear. Mm-hmm you know, that somehow kind of grips the imagination of the whole country. And, you know, those people will become more like Ed Gein. I mean, you know, they'll become almost like folk figures. Yeah, figures. kind of a cautionary and, tale, you, you know. Yeah, and, 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 and those are the, you know, those are the ones I'm kind of interested in writing about. And, and partly I'm interested in writing about them, um, you know, as a way of trying to exploring, you know, why those criminals... Mm-hmm. You know, what is it about their crimes that make them so compelling to the public, you know? Because, again, sometimes the crimes themselves often aren't that horrendous. I mean, if you look back at something like Leopold and Loeb in the 1920s, mm-hmm. you know, one of the major American crimes of the 20th century, you know, it's like, you know, they, they kidnapped and killed a, a teenage boy. You know, which is obviously a terrible thing, but but compared to a lot of other crimes, is that horrendous? Yeah, you know, but on there was scale. something about them, you know, that made that crime incredibly significant. So anyway, so you know, so the the you know the cases I tend to write about, you know, are, are criminals who, again, at the time, somehow the whole country became fascinated by. So. Mm. Mm-hmm. And and in fact, I've been to that area of Wisconsin, and the Gein home no longer exists. The locals burned it down. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Gein became, you know, this, uh, again, he became kind of a folk figure. Mm-hmm. You know, people told jokes about him. and Yeah. You know, people, people I've, I've known people who grew up there who remembered, like, you know, their parents telling them if they didn't behave themselves, Ed Gein would come get them at night. <laughs> oh, that's so Those cruel. Those poor kids. <laughs> you, know, you know, he became, you know, this, like, boogeyman. Yeah, you know? he became the, you know, if you're not a good boy or girl, I'm going to be calling yeah. Uncle Eddie. You know, that, yeah, yeah. that, that kind Absolutely. of thing. And, yeah. and that, yeah. that I know he did not, he died, what did he die, in a nursing home, or was it a, it was a mental facility, wasn't it? That Ed Gein yeah, it was a mental facility, uh, and he died there. And, you know, once he was arrested, you know, he was, uh, he was uh, from all accounts, a very model, you know, model inmate, and, uh, you know, just spent his time reading and so on, and, you just know, never, his mom. you know, never showed any, any signs of violence and stuff. He was a little... You know, again, Dean was not uh, a criminal like uh, Dahmer or Bundy or Gacy. I mean, you know, he, he was not into torturing people and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, he just had you know, issues. most of his most of his victims, you know, were dead to begin with. Yeah, you know, yeah very he true. Was, he did, you know, he did he did murder, as far as we know, two two women, um, but. The majority of his crimes, again, were grave robbing. Um, so, you know, Dean is, you know, really kind of in a, in a class by himself. So. Now, where would you put the son of Sam in all this? Would he be considered a serial killer or more of a mass mm-hmm. murderer? Okay, a serial killer. Yeah, absolutely. Is... Well, again, there's an important distinction. Mass murderers, and again, unfortunately, you see that, uh, you know, all too often nowadays. You know, mass murderers are these uh, basically really suicidal types who, you know, decided, have reached somehow, you know, the end of their rope and uh, and, and they're, they're going to basically go out with a bang. You a know? school they, gunman, for, you know, they're for gonna, instance. You know, they go to some place and they kill a whole bunch of people at once okay. and then often, more often than not, you know, uh, either kill themselves or, you know, arrange to be killed, you know, what's called suicide by cop. You know, yeah. It's basically this 
kind of a, a, a apocalyptic act where they're going to, uh, you know, people who are uh, these desperate people, you know, decided to end their lives, but are going to take out as many people with them as they can. Sure. And, um, you know, very different from serial murder. Again, we're serial murderers. Uh, well, again, like Son of Sam. I mean, Son of Sam was going around shooting these young women and sometimes the men they were with, you know, and then disappearing for a while. And then uh, Son of Sam was... There's a, there's a kind of serial murderer that's sometimes called Lover's Lane Killers. Yep, you know, I, the, the Zodiac Killer in, in San Francisco is another example of that. You know, they will... They, they tend to target often couples who are, like, sitting in cars making out, you know? Yeah. And they'll, they'll, they'll go to these places and, and, and shoot often or kill these people. And, you know, that's where they get their kicks from. So Son of Sam was one of those, again, kind of lover's lane killers. You know? Okay, yeah, because I read about him in some of your works as well. And, mm-hmm. and it's it's uh, he got caught, of course. But he said what he said a dog or another animal told him to yeah. do this. Yeah. And, and, and well, yeah. To me, well, the, Sam Berkowitz was again. I mean, he was, uh, you know, uh, at least borderline. You know, seemed to be borderline psychotic at the time he was committing these crimes. You know, because he seemed to be taking these commands to some extent from this dog mm-hmm. you know that yeah his as crazy as it yeah. sounds well, he was cuckoo for cocoa puffs well yes he was cuckoo yeah. for cocoa puffs yes yeah, yeah. oh good one yeah. serial killer cocoa puffs got it i got the yeah. joke yeah. but 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 again you know the pattern of of the son of sand crimes was typical of serial murder you know you'd have somebody plan out these crimes and go and commit a crime and then there would be this period where, you know, nothing would happen, nothing would happen, and then he'd feel this compulsion again to go out and commit another crime. Uh, And, you know, this this would go on for a while. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those crimes would escalate. That is, you know, they'd become more and more frequent. Um, But it's a very, very different phenomenon from mass murder. And they, you know, where you have, and they you know, probably, somebody going postal, you know. And they probably have to do more extreme things to get that same level of a high. Um, I'm sorry, say it again? They probably have to do more extreme things as they go to get that well, exactly. same level. You know, they be, you know, it becomes like anything else. It's like an addiction. And, uh, you know, to get that uh, high, uh, you, you know, start having to do it more often and more intensely, like so. Okay. That, that yeah, it really it's is like an addiction. A drug addiction. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Harold, we have about a minute and a half left. I want you to plug everything you're doing, where people can find you, and your next books, and all okay. that kind well, of good stuff. Uh, well, um, you know, you can find my books on Amazon uh, dot com. I have a website, but I do have a book coming out in February, which I'm very, very uh, proud of. It's a book called The Mad Sculptor. And uh, it's a book about a, a triple murder that happened in New York City in 1937 uh, that was committed by a very talented artist named Robert Irwin, and um, whose primary victim was this beautiful photographer's model. And it was a very, very sensational case at the time. Uh, the tabloids were all over it. And it led to the biggest manhunt in New York City history. So uh, that's, uh, as I said, it's going to be coming out in February. Mm, that I think sounds February. really good. I'd, yeah. love, I'd love to have you back on the show to talk about that. Yeah, that would be my pleasure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But until yeah. next time, everybody, we got to get going. Harold, again, thank, thank you, you so much for coming on the show. And everybody, thank you for listening. Until next week, next week we will have actually Chad Lewis on the show. He is what they call a legend tripper. He goes, oh, he's a modern-day myth buster. Well, next Ooh. week, yeah, yeah, it'll be a good one. It'll be a real good one. See you guys. Have a good night.